Welcome to the 2011 Raincross Debates. My name is Tom Donahue and I am the current president of the Raincross Group. The Raincross Group has been active since the late 1980s. We are an advocate for open and effective city government through the encouragement with and development of local and diverse community leadership to improve our quality of life in the city of Riverside. This evening, with our partners, Charter Communications and the Press Enterprise, the Raincross Group is hosting three debates for the candidates in Wards 1, 3, and 7. Ward 5 is currently an uncontested contest. These debates will be available for viewing by the voters on Charter Channel 101 and will be streamed online by the Press Enterprise on PE.com beginning the week of April 24th. The Raincross Group is sponsoring these debates because we believe voter participation and education is crucial to the electoral process. The global recession, the state's budget's impact on our city, and the community's vision for the city in our seizing our destiny declaration requires we have city leadership to act decisively, but with discretion, fairness, and vision to improve our quality of life in the city of Riverside. The Raincross Group, Charter Communications, and the Press Enterprise hope these debates will promote further civil discussion of the issues associated with the current campaigns for our city council elections. For those of you who may not be familiar with the boundaries or features of this ward, we have prepared a short video introduction. Ward 3 is the midtown part of Riverside, developed after World War II. At its easterly end is the area around Poly High School, including a segment of historic Victoria Avenue. Near its center is the newly redeveloped Plaza Shopping District with its movie theaters, restaurants, and retail stores. At its western end, the Riverside Municipal Airport and the Industrial Park just north of it are bounded by the Santa Ana River. We are fortunate tonight to have as our moderator Brad Pomerantz. Brad is the anchor for Charter's local edition airing on CNN Headline News. He is an award-winning anchor and reporter for television and radio in Southern California. Thank you, Brad, for agreeing to moderate the 2011 Raincross Debates. The show is now yours. Thank you, Tom, for having me. My name is Brad Pomerantz. I host Charter's Local Edition and Charter's Special Edition. You can watch Charter's Local Edition on CNN, HLN, and Special Edition on Charter Channel 101. If you don't get Charter, we can help you with that, so just let us know. Um, in our audience today, I want to welcome Councilwoman Nancy Hart of Riverside, Riverside School Board President Kathy Alavi, and the Chief of Staff to Mayor Ron Loveridge, Kristen Tilquist. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it very much. And I guess one could say I feel quite at home on this stage because these debates are designed to inform the public just as we try to do on local edition, special edition. As we all know, voting is an important responsibility and it's a privilege and one that should not be taken lightly. It is so important to participate in the electoral process and the best way to do that is by making informed decisions. It is my hope that this debate will help all of us prepare and decide who we want to vote for. And again, we thank the Raincross Group for engaging voters and leading to higher voter participation. Just a quick anecdote, as you know, four years ago, the Ward 1 contest was decided by seven votes. Every single vote counts. So please vote early and often, and this year it's by mail. I would like to begin this afternoon by introducing our distinguished panel of guests. As Tom mentioned, Gail Hammonds is out sick, and we will miss her very much. She is the editorial page editor of the Press Enterprise. But filling in for 
Uh, Gail is Colette Lee from the Rain Cross Group. Colette is the owner of Tower Realty and the Tower Property Management Group and has served on multiple community boards and organizations, including the CBU Board of Visitors, we thank you for that, UCR Board of Trustees, the Junior League of Riverside, Citizens University Committee, California Riverside Ballet, just to name a few. Next to Colette is Orlando Ramirez. He is the editor of the Spanish language newspaper La Prensa, a sister publication of the Press Enterprise. Of course, La Prensa serves a vital role in informing, informing our Spanish-speaking residents uh, in Riverside about important news and events. And our third panelist is Rain Cross Group member Becky Diaz. She is the executive director of the Community Settlement Association, a social services agency located in the east side neighborhood of Riverside. Again, we thank all of you for joining us for the Rain Cross debates. A special thank you to our viewers online at pe.com and our viewers watching on Charter Channel 101. Let's turn our attention to the candidates themselves. As we said, right now we are featuring two candidates seeking election from Ward 3. Uh, in this election, which is conducted by mail, a candidate must receive 50% plus one in order to win. Given there are only two candidates in this race, the winner in this primary election will become the next councilman for Ward 3 in the great city of Riverside. Uh, the incumbent in Ward 3 is Rusty Bailey. Mr. Bailey, who is completing his first term on the City Council, is a teacher, student body moderator, and coach at Poly High School. He previously served on the City's Cultural Heritage Board. Uh, Mr. Bailey is being challenged by James Harold Davis, who has worked as a structural iron worker welder and is currently employed as a fabrication inspector. He has lived in Riverside since 1947. And we thank you both for agreeing to participate in the Rain Cross debates. We do have some rules that we want to lay out for the candidates and the audience. Uh, we will begin with the candidates' two-minute introductory statements. Afterwards, our three panelists will ask questions, and each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond. Each candidate will then receive 30 seconds to offer a rebuttal or amplification of his or her remarks. In this case, his remarks. Um, as the moderator, it is within my purview, and I will take that, uh, that allegiance to invite a panelist to follow up on a question or ask myself a candidate to focus their answer more closely on the question being asked. If I feel a candidate is avoiding the question, I reserve the right to ask the candidate to be more specific and more to the point with the questions. As Tom asked, we respectfully request that our audience refrain from excessive applause. Such excessive applause does take away from the time available to a candidate to answer the panel's questions. And please turn off your phones. In our last session, we had a chicken ring. So we beg you to turn off your cell phones. With that, it is my supreme pleasure to invite Colette Lee to ask our first question. Colette. Oh, no, I misspoke. Thank you. I'm going to turn to our panelists, and I'm going to ask them to offer their opening statements. Forgive me. We're going to start with the incumbent, Mr. Rusty Bailey. The purpose of the United States Military Academy at West Point mm -hmm. is to provide the nation with leaders of character who serve the common defense. I have served this country as an officer of the United States Army, and now serve this city as a high school teacher and Ward 3 City Councilman. I received my inspiration of service. Uh, from my forefathers. Russ Bailey came to Riverside in 1914 from Missouri and went through the schools, RCC, on to Stanford, back here to serve this community as a school district administrator. My father joined him after graduating Poly High School, went to Stanford, and got his law degree, and came back to serve this city and, and this community as a Superior Court judge. It is my hope that my daughters will continue this almost 100 years of service to this city. My philosophy of a councilman is that a local elected official has three major roles. First and foremost is the role as a representative of our ward, taking care of the needs of residents and businesses, serving the will of the people at City Hall. The second hat is that of a decision maker for the entire city, and thus a councilman needs to be able to operate within a group of legislators who sometimes compete for scarce resources. Council members must also work with other governmental bodies, like school districts and their boards, and with other levels of government, whether at the county, state, or federal level. Thirdly, council members act as problem solvers, which gives our constituents confidence that government is working for them and not against them. 
From what I've seen over the last four years, the city of Riverside stands alone as an incredible problem-solving machine, answering 188,311 phone calls last year alone on problems and issues ranging from potholes to graffiti, stray shopping carts to broken streetlights, and all these problems were typically taken care of within 24 hours. Now that is service. The city of Riverside is the most responsive and responsible government in the state of California. In terms of fiscal responsibility, the city council has maintained a reserve fund of over $40 million for emergencies as well as to keep our credit rating one of the best in California. Last year, managed savings by our council and city manager created over $3 million to invest back into projects like the Metro Metropolitan Museum remodel, Heritage House re-roofing, new parking at Andulka, Rusty, providing jobs for local residents. I'm running for re-election to continue to serve Ward 3 and the city of Riverside. Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I want to address a, a pension system, a system which allows employees to retire with 90% of their pay at age 50 and contribute nothing to the plan. This plan is far and away beyond the wildest dreams and financial capabilities of the general public that are forced to pay for these plans. These plans are the sweetest deal you can get without a gun. The mayor's declared pension reform a top priority for 2011. I question the resolve of the mayor and several members on the city council who are themselves accumulating several tax-funded pensions. I offer a clear change for a fair and just pension plan and a city government that doesn't exploit the many for the benefit of the few. Government should be equal, fair, and honest. I envision a plan where all participants pay a fair share and retire at a reasonable age. I envision a, envision a plan that doesn't lead us to a financial train wreck. I envision a solid financial foundation and prosperous economic future for all Riversiders, not just the select few. None of which is possible with the current unsustainable pension programs. The only pension plan shared by the general public is Social Security, which demands 60, age 67 for full benefits and based on the last five years you work. City, county, and state employees do not pay Social Security. Any other private sector employee plan requires a contribution by the employee and uh, matching contributions by the employer, never 100% of the cost. Our government is rapidly approaching a point of being unable to perform the duties we established it to do and only pay for wages and benefit of public employees. This could explain our mad scramble for redevelopment bonds. Thank you. Uh, we will be addressing pension reform within this debate, so Mr. Bailey, you can hold off if you choose uh, to address that one issue. As we proceed, it's my pleasure to introduce and re-welcome Colette Lee for our first question. Thank you. C gentlemen, consider the goals, routes of the Seizing Our Destiny agenda. Which goals do you find most important, and will you direct and hold city staff accountable to implement these goals. We'll start with Mr. Bailey, 90 seconds. Well, as the elected leader of Route 3 Lifelong Learning for All, that's the most near and dear to my heart. Um, I was gonna address that in the, in the closing remarks, but I'll go ahead and do that now. What, what I've done as the elected leader is to convene the Riverside Roundtable to get all the chancellors, superintendents, and presidents, including the Cal Baptist president, um, to the table, as well as our county uh, superintendent, Ken Young, to the table, uh, to, to look at a comprehensive approach to education, not just higher levels of education, uh, school districts or even community colleges, to look at it as, as uh, one uh, challenge for us. And they have come to those meetings and they have, have talked and, and, and figured out um, some commonalities and we're looking at a couple of interesting projects along those lines such as a transfer tra transportation route from UCR down University to Magnolia uh, which hits UCR then community college a couple um, business districts the plaza the Galleria goes to Cal Baptist here on Magnolia and then out to La Sierra so connecting the dots there in the education community as well as supporting the school districts in their effort to be a, a district of choice and, and, and making sure that they have uh, schools that are challenging their students at every level, such as the STEM Academy, the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Academy, um, is, and, and the bilingual programs that they're starting in the schools. So we're making sure that we have a comprehensive approach, that we're passing off students from one level to another in a way that's going to set them up for success for the, for the long run. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Davis. Uh, would you repeat that question? Certainly. Consider the goals 
and the roots of seizing our destiny agenda. Which goals do you find the most important and how will you direct and hold the city account accountable, um, city staff accountable to implement these goals? Oh, I see, okay. Uh, well, uh, I have to say that um, as far as uh, your, your discussion on education goes, there's a vast need for engineers, uh, uh, scientists and mathematicians. There's a huge shortage of that. That's what they're Mr. Talking. Davis, we can address that in rebuttal right now. Okay. We'd like you to focus on the question, okay, which the question. deals with the seizing our destiny agenda. Eleven routes were adopted by members of the city council uh, in conjunction with UCR's business school. So we're asking, as Mr. Bailey did, he focused on Route 3, which dealt with education. So if you can focus on one of the 11 Oh, rounds. you know what? I'm not familiar with them. So. Okay. Given that, if you could um, talk about uh, one of the goals that is most important well, to you. I think the goal of our city is, is to make a good, solid financial future for everyone and, and uh, get, get the finances in order so that we can face the future here in Riverside. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, we now have time for a rebuttal. And why don't we start with Mr. Bailey? Well, um, you know, seeing as we are the, the city of arts innovation, Creativity Central Route 9 is another uh, route that, that, you know, I've ancillarily worked on. Um, my daughter loves to go to the Riverside Art Museum and be a part of the, the programs that they have there. Uh, Thursday Night Arts Walk is becoming a, a destination for not just Riversiders, but for the region. I think we've been written up in the LA Times for uh, that once a month activity that, that we do and bring people together in downtown Riverside. So we need to continue to build on those types of, of, of programs uh, and concepts. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Davis, you have 30 seconds if you so choose to respond. No. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're going to proceed with Orlando Ramirez of La Prensa. Gentlemen, what specific characteristics and qualities would you expect of new businesses in Ward 3 to cater to younger patrons? What is the retail and entertainment strategy, incentives you would support to assist and attract businesses that cater to this younger demographic? And we're going to start with Mr. Davis. Uh, well, attracting uh, our younger generation seems to be a problem for everybody, uh, unless it involves uh, something electrical. But uh, uh, it, it would, I'd love to get our younger people involved in our city uh, functions and, and in, our, uh, in Ward 3, or actually throughout the entire city. Um, uh, but uh, I, it's a mystery to me on how to get the young people involved in that. Mr. Bailey. Um, you know, Ward 3 is, is right in the, in the middle of Riverside. It, it sits in between Pauline and Ramona, Sierra Middle School, and so it's just a natural congregating place for a lot of kids, a lot of youth, a lot of students, and that happens at the plaza, uh, and there's some that, that also go to the Brockton Arcade. I think uh, what, what I've done is to, um, to build on the successes of the plaza. They've got some great entertainment there to attract the kids. Uh, I have heard from my students that they, they do have a pretty aggressive curfew policy there that uh, you know, we, we, we've talked about with the plaza ownership, but one thing we need to do is to try to connect kids up with activities, um, especially physical activities. And so what we've done recently is sat down with the plaza and made bike uh, approaches to the plaza. Uh, the concept is to, to encourage them to, dr to ride their bikes to the plaza, to the Brockton Arcade, um, so that they are getting some physical activity and, uh, you know, enjoying themselves at the same time. So we're going to do a mural. At, on, on the back of the plaza, put in some more bike racks, um, have some signage for bikes. Brockton Arcade is a perfect place to, to attract pedestrians, to have youth living in the, 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 uh, the residential communities in walking distance to go to the Brockton Arcade. But we do have to, to look at the businesses and, and help them market themselves through uh, you know, Facebook and, and other um, connectors that kids use. Um, you know, that, that's where they, they are now. They're on their, their phones, they're on their uh, devices, uh, looking for places to go. Time. And so we need to connect that with, with the businesses in, in the Brockton Arcade. Especially. In your rebuttal, I'd like you to consider the following. As we all know, University of California at Riverside will be opening a medical school next fall. I know it's not in Ward 3. Um, but presumably the city council works together, and so we're going to have an influx of younger patrons, one could argue, 20-somethings. Uh, and so in your rebuttal, talk to us about what you'd like to see in terms of harnessing the power of California's first new medical school in years. We can start with Mr. D uh, Davis. 
Oh, I think it's an ex exceptional opportunity for us. I mean, it's vitally needed uh, medical service. We're short on doctors and all kinds of medical staff. So um, anything we can do to aid and, and assist that is going to be beneficial. But what about the serving the needs of those new youngsters, the 20-somethings, that are coming into the city so that they don't commute into L.A., but they realize they can come to UCR, well, UCR school. does put on some programs for their students out there and concerts and so forth. It entertains the people. There's a lot of facilities around there as well. Uh, the, our plaza is a, a, a gathering place for young people. I live across the street from it, so mm. they're over there all the time. Um, I don't know. I don't, they don't bother me, but, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, I'm sure, as all young people do, get a little rambunctious, but... Uh, uh, it seems to be a big gathering place, so um, I think we do have some facilities. We could expand on that. Um, everything is going electronic, so they are on Facebook and they're on Twitter, and these things are, are, are uh, would be important for businesses to attract right. them. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Bailey. You know, I, you mentioned that it's not going to be in Ward 3. Well, I wish it was. <laughs> I think it's an opportunity lost, to tell you the truth, and an economic engine that we don't have that, we didn't have a policy discussion on that, being located in downtown Riverside where there are amenities for young people, outdoor events, competitions, bars and restaurants. And so I'd like to go back to that discussion if possible. Uh, to, and, and I have to, to a, a, you know, a couple regents and an assemblyman. Um, I don't know if the opportunity is lost or not. But that's the connection we need to make is to bring that, that economic engine to downtown where there is housing opportunities for younger people and amenities existing in the downtown right now. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bailey. We're gonna proceed with uh, Ms. Diaz. Gentlemen, I have a twofold question. What is the appropriate amount of time that you believe a city council representative should devote to the job? And secondarily, what are the resources that should be provided to council members, such as a city car, car allowance, paid staff? We're gonna start with Mr. Bailey. Well, I can tell you from time frame, there's never enough time to serve the people. There's continuous uh, demands of elected officials at, at every level, including the school board. I know my wife uh, sends emails pretty regularly to school board members, um, you know, in Riverside talking about the schools. And, and I get e you know, emails around the clock, phone calls around the clock. I've had people come to my doorstep and knock on and say, Councilman Bailey, what can you do about this problem? So there's never enough time, again, in, in this capacity uh, so in terms of resources, you know, whatever can make, um, and, and we're, we got to tighten our budget. We got to tighten our, our, our belts because of the economic times we're in. Uh, we, we don't want to do anything uh, illegal, obviously, or beyond the resources that, that we have. We want to lead by example, I would say, in, in, in any type of um, resource that is given to us. But if there's a way for us, such as a BlackBerry, that we can get our emails to us regularly and we can respond back at any time instead of having to go to a computer downtown or at home to respond to our constituents, having the, giving them access. Or we can do to provide more access and make it more efficient for us to respond to those issues, um, I think would be appropriate. Mr. Davis. Um, well, I, I think the city council is supposedly a part-time job, but I think you devote your time as is needed on there. As people call you, you have to go to work for it. Um, um, I forget the other part of the question. Oh, on the, as far as the mm -hmm. uh, automobiles and things like that, I've never been provided a car in my life for a job I did. So I figure I'll use my own um, and pay for my own gas. That's, uh, that's part of the job. Um, I would like to see a, um, a, a plan. I, uh, I would like to try and broker a deal between the businesses in our area and uh, uh, the labor organizations and try and establish a tech school so that we could uh, educate some welders. The American Welding Society says that there's a need for 200,000 welders in this country. We don't have technical help. Not all these kids or older men are not going to all go to school. So uh, they need an active way to make a job, and that's a good living. Uh, there's a lot of innovative ideas in welding. So, so let's try to focus on the exact question, which was the time that should be spent. The time that should be spent? That's, like I say, as much time as is needed to do the job. I'd like to follow up as part of our rebuttal period. We uh, discussed this in the last debate, and I'd like to get a sense from these two candidates. Riverside is one of the largest cities in the region, in California. Uh, the population is, is exploding. And so my question for both of you is, do you believe it is time 
to turn the Riverside City Council into a full-time position with accompanying pay that is full-time commensurate with other cities of like size in terms of compensation. Why don't we start with Mr. Davis? Right now, I don't think that's a good idea uh, financially. I mean, we've got, um, uh, we need to do something to the city to, to get uh, some of the 13% uh, of the people un that are unemployed back to work. We need to start uh, working on developing business interests and try and draw them into this city. We've got a lot of people out of work and, and without those people working, not everybody sharing in the full dream of the city. Uh, Mr. Davis, in the last debate we heard some candidates uh, present a proposal to eliminate legislative aids for city council members. Would you support or oppose the elimination of legislative aids? Uh, well, I, no, I'm not sure I would support that. I think you might need one. I don't know how many legislative aids are available to the city council, but I, uh, I'm sure that uh, one would be very, very beneficial in doing your job. Mr. Bailey, a uh, full-time position and legislative aids, I think, I think the bottom line is, you know, what are the expectations of the electorate? And so I would give it back to them in the form of a measure, probably the appropriate time right now is the charter review is being reviewed by the committee uh, that I was on 10 years ago. I think that's a, uh, something for them to look at and study and to present to the voters uh, to see if they want, again, a full-time council member. They're available studying, going to uh, various functions, not just in our city, but, but regionally speaking. Uh, I can tell you that there is not enough time in the day to, to, to meet the demands that, that are in front of council members. As a citizen in Riverside, if that provision was presented to the voters, would you be in support or would you oppose that provision turning the city council into a full-time position? I can tell you that people, ex people have told me, what do you mean it's not full-time? What do you mean you're not getting paid full-time or compensated enough to, 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 not to leave your job as a teacher uh, and go full-time? into public service as a council member. Um, so is that so, so I think, yes, we need to put it on the ballot and let the, let the voters decide. Um, but how would you, would you come, would you be, uh, when you get the slate card, would it say Rusty Bailey in support? I, I think it goes back, yeah, it goes back to the expectations of, of the people. Do they, ex, do they expect, do they, the value of a city council person, is it full time? Okay, and then uh, yes I, or no, do you support or oppose the elimination of legislative aids for city council people? No, I think again, it goes back to resources and it, and it allows access from my ward to City Hall, better access, better service when it comes from uh, the councilman from the ward. Great, thank you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, Colette, back to you. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, traffic impacts all residents of the city. How would you address with your council colleagues the Overlook Parkway project that has been in discussion for years? And we're going to start with Mr. Davis. Let me repeat that question. Certainly. Um, traffic impacts all residents of the city. How would you address your council colleagues in the Overlook Parkway project that has been in discussion for years? Uh, well, I, I've heard those discussions out there. You're talking about the Overlook up on uh, Central Avenue up there? No, Overlook Parkway is off of Washington Avenue, and it's a parkway that would connect one side of town to the other side, dumping into Alessandro Boulevard, connecting to Canyon Crest Drive onto the UCR um, campus. Oh, I'm not even familiar with that uh, problem out there. Okay. Uh, so will you pass? Is, is that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Mr. Bailey. Well, it's obviously uh, a legislative issue, uh, especially when it comes to, um, you know, ward representation that, that we, as I mentioned before in my opening, that we have on the council. You represent your ward, and so Ward 4, which is going to be impacted the most by Overlook Parkway, is potentially going to have some problems with that. Um, and yet, when you look at the entire city, um, if you were an at-large council member, I think it would be an easier vote for that body to say it was designed uh, for, as a parkway, it was designed for the traffic, there is no driveways uh, on, on that, so we don't have conflicts with cars coming and going. Um, there's ways to minimize the traffic on, on Overlook Parkway if we were to put it through by putting stop signs or if they needed speed bumps or otherwise to keep the cut through traffic at a, at a, at a minimal. So, you know, I had the same issue in Ward 3 at Fairview, and 
ultimately, we ended up putting a park down at Andulka, and they never punched uh, Central Avenue through, through, and that's why we have two Centrals in, in Fairview. And, it, you know, and, and I agree with that, because it wasn't designed for the load of traffic that ultimately would have been there. Uh, but when you look at Overlook and land use and the general plan, it's been there forever, and so we, we definitely need to look at that um, as a potential to decrease, you know, the, the traffic problems that we're having potentially on Victoria or on Central for, for local traffic. And, and I've t talked to people and people have said, listen, I would use that, you know, to get to Canyon Coast Town Center to spend my money. Uh, so, you know, I mean, that, that debate's going to continue with the ward council Time. member Rusty. and the city. Mr. Bailey. Uh, Orlando Ramirez of uh, La Prensa. Do you think the city's current pension system is sustainable? Do you favor a new second tier system for new employees? Should the city end the existing practice of covering employees' share of pension costs, even for existing workers? We're going to start with Mr. Bailey. No, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not sustainable. We figured that out to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you know, of, of uh, unfunded entitlements, if you want to call them that, or mandates. Um, the two-tier system is already, you know, been put into effect for, from the firefighter association. So we got to thank them for their leadership by example in that respect, coming to the table, re recognizing the problem that we face in the long run. And that's what city councils need to do is look at not just today or next year, but 10, 20, 30 years down the road for the economic vitality of our city. And so that's the tough debate that we're having and tough negotiations we're having right now with the unions. We're coming to the table um, and, and, and we're working through those to make sure that contracts are respected, uh, to make sure that workers are respected, to make sure that we can maintain the employment force, the most efficient and effective employment force we can um, with the money that is, is, is coming in through the revenues. So in that respect, um, we've got some work to do, and, and we are working on it now. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Um, no, I don't think it's sustainable, and um, no, I don't agree with the two-tiered system. Uh, Los Angeles County's had a two-tiered system for years down there, and, and I have to question how equal that is uh, if you're having asking people to do the same job with a different uh, pay standard. Um, I think everybody that receives a pension should contribute to it. I don't think every, uh, somebody else should pay for your pension. So, uh, but um, the two-tiered system, I don't think, is the answer. I like to see uh, if everyone's doing the same job, they should get the same pay, you know. Um, as part of the follow-up and your chance to respond, I want to expand on the two-tier issue. As you probably know, there is no ability to change the pension system of current employees unless their representatives agree to that. You'd have to negotiate with right. them, yeah. So, so how do you not create a scenario where there isn't going to be a two-tier system? I well, mean, how do you level. continue a, a system that's unsustainable? I think um, um, it, it seems to me like the older employees are just trying to protect what they get without paying for it. And, uh, and then the new employees, you're admitting that it's not a wrong system, it's not working by uh, paying, uh, having the new employees pay their share. If you could not get the union to agree to the same system that the new employees are going to receive, would you scrap the reform system entirely because it would be, in your view, inequitable? Well, you're going to have these contracts come up for renegotiation. You're just going to have to stand and negotiate with them. You know, that's where the, you have the city council, that's what they're there for, to protect all the people's interests. Mr. Bailey, how would you address the concerns that Mr. Davis presents in terms of the perceived inequity of a two-tier system? Well, I would agree to, with Mr. Davis in terms of, you know, negotiating. That's, that's the way to do it, uh, again, in, in, in a way that's respectful of the workers, uh, making sure that they fully understand uh, what they're signing up for. I think Riverside has always been an attractive place to, 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 to live, work, and play, in this case, work. I think we'll continue to have people knocking on our doors to be firefighters and to be police officers and to be, uh, you know, electrical workers and parks workers in this city because of the reputation and because of the Riverside Renaissance that has invested so much money into our infrastructure. Um, so in that respect, uh, you know, the negotiation process, we do have to take, uh, you know, a leadership position there as a city council and look tw 10, 20, 30 years down the line to see what makes sense uh, for, for our future. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Becky. 
Gentlemen, the 2010 census shows Riverside is now a majority minority community. What is the city doing, or in your opinion, what it should be doing to reach out and address the needs of our growing and diverse population? And if I can interrupt, Becky, do you have those statistics that you can read for the candidates? I do, be happy to do so. Thank you. It shows that we're now 49% Latino, 7% African American, 7% Asian, and 24% Caucasian. And we're going to start with Mr. Bailey. I think we continue doing what we're doing. We're known as an inclusive and, and diverse community. We have the Greer Pavilion on top of City Hall as not only a symbol, but as a, a gathering place for the diverse populations we have. And, and they, it continues to be used um, uh, and, and, and a place of welcome for you know, people from all over the country. And that's kind of where our international uh, activities um, uh, you know, come to fruition there with the uh, Sister Cities International um, uh, and, and, and International Relations Council that we have. Uh, you know, we continue to, to, to have parades celebrating the various backgrounds and diversity and ethnicities that we have in the city. We have a youth council that brings together some of the most diverse individuals, uh, you know, in this city, future leaders that need to be taught and, and educated and, and encouraged to, to continue with, with the efforts that we've made when it comes to including diverse backgrounds. And, and I think that the youth have been left out in many, many respects uh, until recently when we developed the Youth Council, um, other groups like the PIT group, Young Professionals group, that is, is joining the ranks of, uh, of the leadership in Riverside and encouraging various populations, whether it's young, uh, old, uh, different, different ethnicities uh, or otherwise, to invest their time, money, and resources into the city and provide, you know, do community service hours and those types of things. So I think we're doing a great job. We can always do better uh, in, in those ways that I've talked about. Mr. Davis. Well, people come to our, our country for uh, the opportunities that are presented here. Uh, the uh, uh, growing ethnic group is changing, has changed since since this country began, you know, uh, we've had different eth ethnic groups become majorities and, and um, as they continue to grow, the city of LA has 72% Latino. Um, so, and you can see how that's, uh, it's a problem that, uh, or a situation that actually corrects itself. More, more and more Latino people are involved in politics and city government, and I, I suspect that's going to happen here. Um, as far as involving youth, that's like trying to involve voters. Some of them just refuse to be involved. I mean, you do everything. We've got tremendous amount of youth programs, things like that. But if you don't take advantage of it, um, uh, you know, it, it seems like a failure, but uh, maybe it's just a lost opportunity for them. In common, I'd like you to zero in on one issue, and that's the Latino community in Riverside. The Latino community grew 78% in the last 10 years. That is explosive growth. And so I'd like you to really consider giving us your plan to look at that community and what can the city do for such a vibrant part of the city of Riverside. It's going to be 50% tomorrow, essentially. Uh, we'll start with Rusty. Mr. Bailey. Again, continue doing what we're doing. I, I don't think that we're, we're doing anything wrong. Uh, we have the Latino Network and the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that, uh, you know, elected leaders need to get out to and connect with and make sure and go to, to events that they have and, and, and open the, keep those lines of communication open with them. Um, you know, what about Spanish speakers, for example? I mean, many of our Latino uh, residents are bilingual, but some are not. And so how do we bring in Spanish speakers? Maybe Orlando can uh, yeah, you, you pipe know, in if you'd like. You know, the, the mayor of, of Denver uh, very thoughtfully had, a, had an, a summit, a Hispanic education summit that connected the families and the kids with the resources in the city and beyond. And I think that that would be a, um, a, a great thing to do in, in this city because education is so important. Uh, for everybody, but especially when you look at the statistics in, the, in the, the Latino community when it comes to education, that's some work that needs to be addressed. And so I think an education summit would be, would be a, an important step in the, in the right direction. Uh, Mr. Davis, again, focus, what can the city do 
to invite, to welcome in, to serve the needs of a growing Latino population and consider while many Latinos in our region are bilingual, some are monolingual. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a strong uh, Irish background and I'm not quite sure what America would have to offer me that would be indicative to Irish uh, any more than our country would have to offer to people coming here from Mexico. I mean, you have a large Latino, Spanish-speaking population. We have uh, uh, bilingual programs in the schools. Uh, we try and uh, uh, get them educated and uh, get them speaking English. Um, so what issues are you saying that, they, that we need to address as a nation um, beyond our, you know, what we offer for everyone else? Well, let's continue, if we may, or... Uh, if I may. Please. Uh, specifically, immigration. We have a large undocumented uh, Latino community in the area. It seems to be uh, the invisible community. Correct. Uh, we, we haven't do. seen too much coming out uh, uh, from uh, the city regarding that. I'm not sure the city is a proper thing, but mm -hmm. as you seek your candidacy here, uh, it is 49% is a significant number, and oh, it will tremendous. continue to grow. Uh, we also have uh, the high rate of dropouts in the high school community, mm -hmm. which is uh, something that we would like to see addressed. So my, my two questions would be, how would you address the education high school issue and then the immigration issue? Well, the immigration issue, again, um, is, is really a federal issue. Uh, we, we have, uh, in, in our country, we immigrate legally nearly a million people every single year. And so there's a lot that come in uh, illegally, but they're here. So we need to deal with that situation. Um, and um, they would have to participate too. The problem is a lot of those people do not want to get out and participate because they're afraid they're going to get deported, you know. So, I mean, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, I came here illegally, but now I want, want these services. And, but if I ask for the services, I might get deported, so. Uh, Mr. Bailey, could you follow up on Becky's question, please? Sure. Um, my first period class is Hospitality Academy. It's 75% Latino. Uh, these are at-risk kids. Parents didn't go to college. And what, what we've decided to do in the school district is to identify them early and, and uh, support them, scaffold them um, through job training as well as education. And so that they can graduate high school with skills uh, you know, and, and, and join the workforce if they want to or go into a culinary academy uh, or beyond. And so that's, that's definitely one way is to, to continue with programs like AVID. Uh, Ramona is one of the, the best in the country. Um, I think it's a, close to 100% of, of the graduates from AVID get into a four-year university uh, or college. And so education is definitely a focus that we need to continue um, to keep our eyes on. And, and, and I would agree with uh, uh, you know, Mr. Davis that the federal government and state government, we need to get... Um, you know, together on, on the immigration issue and, 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 and figure out the best course of, of action there. I'm going to go off script slightly, and I'd like to offer Mr. Ramirez an opportunity to a ask a question on this issue. He is the editor of La Prensa. I think the impetus behind this question is um, the recent Charter Review Commission, where it had to be expanded to be more inclusive. Um, what concrete steps would you take as a city councilman to be more inclusive within the structure of the city to get more input from um, not just the Spanish-speaking community, but also the, uh, the bilingual Latino community. I'll start with Mr. Bailey, please. You know, that, that uh, has been something that we've been working on, um, again, for the last few years. I know I've worked on hard for the last, last four years, but you know, more than just ethnicity, age. I think that that was a serious uh, lack lacking, uh, you know, piece to the, the boards and commissions representation puzzle that we had downtown. And so I focused my efforts at engaging the younger community, the pit group, some of my former students to apply to be on boards and commissions. And a number of them were interviewed and some of them uh, were appointed. Uh, if you look at all the boards and commissions across the line, you will see a very diverse and even more younger as our age now, median age in Riverside is below 30, it's 29. And so we need to make sure that we don't lose track of the age um, component to diversity and inclusiveness. I, did, I do think we, we did drop the ball when it came to the Charter Review Committee, but that um, is, is being fixed. I think some of the responsibility lies on the people to apply, and we did go out to the group. Latino Network knew about uh, the Charter Review coming up. It was in the paper. Um, I had encouraged Jose Medina, a friend, a colleague of mine at, at, 
at Poly High School to apply. He chose not to. Now he is going to apply. So, you know, that's, that's sometimes the responsibility lies on those groups to keep their eyes on the ball and to make sure that they are putting candidates into those positions that w will give them um, the ability to affect public policy in, in Riverside. Mr. Davis. Well, um, once again, um, it's, a, it's a matter of, of uh, some of those people coming forward and they're afraid to. I, I'm a fabrication inspector. I go into factories, plants all over the United States and particularly out here and in Arizona. I go into places and, and uh, a lot of the uh, places I go into, it, it's a very strong Spanish language. Those, those uh, folks speak Spanish and, and I notice uh, an, very few of them uh, will actually come up and interact with you and talk to you, even the English speaking ones. They, they have a fear of, of actually opening up to somebody and I'm probably, as a representative of the LA airport, I probably am, am probably a, a authority figure. So they may not, they're not going to <laughs> open up to that. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem and it's all created by uh, just no border control. I mean, it's gonna get worse. Uh, until we can get it better to get some assimilation. I'm going to continue to digress and ask a question that was famously posed by an older Ronald Reagan to a younger Walter Mondale. And the question will be uh, to both candidates, uh, how does age play a factor in this race? Will you hold Mr. Bailey's tender age against him? Mr. Bailey, will you hold Mr. Uh, Davis's age against him? <laughs> we'll start with Mr. Davis. Well, um, first of all, Mr. Bailey has a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. um, so he's not a young, tender age person. He taught my grandson in, in high school, so I wouldn't say it's too tender. Uh, I'm an <laughs> older guy, so um, it's uh, whether you, you want to choose somebody that's older uh, to uh, handle that. Mr. Bailey. Well, it's a good question. It's about perspective. Uh, Mr. Davis happens to be my dad's classmate from Poly High School. The reunion's coming up uh, this year, so they'll be getting together uh, the next couple weeks after the debate, I guess. Um, it's about perspective. I, I have two kids at home, and, and we go out to parks on a, on a regular basis, and so I get to see a different side to the story maybe than Mr. Davis, who, who might attend the Gosky Center. They won't let me play pool over there because I'm not over 50. So um, <laughs> you, you will know, be it, soon. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's about perspective and, and experience, and right now I'm at a stage in my life where I have a family and we go out and do activities uh, and, and, and you know and that's that's part of the hopefully the, the city's image that we're working on is to be fit fresh and fun thank you for letting us uh, go off script we'll cut back on the script right now excellent job candidates if I may say we're gonna continue with Colette Lee thank you so much in light of the recent questions regarding Marcy library library appraisal car allowances and various council perks what changes would you make to ensure more transparency at City Hall and provide timely access to public documents pertaining to city government issues, gentlemen. And we'll start with Mr. Davis. Well, I was going to uh, talk about the redevelopment in my closing statement, but uh, we'll address that now. Uh, the Marcy Branch um, is one of the reasons I, I consider a very strong reason to eliminate redevelopment because there's no accountability and, and uh, uh, transparency with that. Um, the, the, that thing le should leave a bad taste in everybody's mouth in this city because uh, the original pra uh, the, uh, right appraisal would never have come to light had it not been for two very diligent people in the city and uh, they, who were very persistent and forced that issue. Uh, now what's happened is instead of making a clean business transition, I don't think it was the, the business owner that had anything wrong here, but without doing that, now it, it, this is going to be a big debate, and it might be a while before we settle what, uh, what really happens to Marcy Branch there. I, I will uh, disagree there and, and let you know that there was timely access and transparent meetings going on. I had been talking about uh, this potential uh, concept to various groups like the Magnolia Area Neighborhood Alliance to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we had a development committee meeting prior to it being, uh, you know, pulled off the agenda because of negotiations between the business entity that we're, you know, looking to, to, to trade the Marcy Branch Library to. There are two very important components that a lot of people, so thanks for asking the question because I can educate people on uh, what the redevelopment agency does, its effectiveness, why it's an important tool for the city to be able to, uh, you know, affect change because otherwise we have blighted properties sitting around 
creating public nuisances, attractive nuisances for neighborhoods, and we don't have a, a real mechanism to do anything about that. In this case, the Marcy Branch Library, or excuse me, the, the um, Lucky Greek sits next to remnant property that would almost double the size of its existing uh, piece of property, which would allow the redevelopment agency, the business arm of, of the city, uh, which meets every Tuesday night in a public meeting, um, to, to look at you know, a higher and better use for, for that property, not just the Lucky Greek, but the property adjacent at the Magnolia grade separation, combining those two properties. And that's what the redevelopment agency does, acquires and joins properties together and then sells them for higher and better uses. So um, the, we've been working on this issue for four years before I came into office, the, the Lucky Greek looking for another place to, uh, to locate. And this happened to be the one that they said, okay, yeah, that one Time. works for us. We're gonna have two quick follow-ups. Uh, Governor Jerry Bryan of California has called for the complete elimination of redevelopment agencies in the state of California. Do you support or oppose that plan? Yes or no, Mr. Davis? Um, I support that plan. Um, I, I think that uh, the redevelopment agencies uh, divert a lot of the um, taxes into redevelopment agencies that normally would go into local uh, uh, agencies like police and, and schools. Mr. Bailey. Redevelopment does uh, deserve scrutiny, and it gets that because the redevel redevelopment agency board meets again every Tuesday night as a part of the city council. We have a staff of potentially 30 or 40 people that work at the city that um, are, are, are making sure you know that these redevelopment um, projects are, are legally uh, completed and uh, the structure and the finances are, are taken care of. Do you support I can tell you, or oppose Governor Brown's plan to completely eliminate redevelopment agencies? I do not support his plan. It, it provides 1,264 jobs to Ward 3 over the last five, six years and $17 million in investment just in Ward 3. And if you can follow up briefly on the part of the question posed by Colette dealing with council uh, perks. Mr. Bailey and Mr. Davis. Again, we Bailey. need to tighten the ship, just like everybody has at home. We're going to lead by example in doing that. You know, the, con the term perks is, is the issue. Of course, you know, we're not going to agree to have any perks, right? But if we're down there for 12 hours a day, do we deserve to have some cookies and a couple Cokes? Is that a perk, you know, to be able to uh, uh, make sure that good public policy comes out of the meetings that we have on a daily basis down at City Hall. So are we um, being, uh, you know, serving the public to the best of our ability? And, and um, whether, whether or not, um, you know, we can, we can provide better access, uh, you know, through resources provided to council members, that's the question. Okay, Mr. Davis. Well, as a representative of the people of the city, I'm not going to about to uh, enhance my income uh, at the people's cost when we've got so many people unemployed. I, I, it's not right. It's not the right time, whether you deserve it or not. It's not a matter of what you deserve in a job. It's, it's how much the people can afford. So uh, I would not do that. I wouldn't do it right now. And so if, if I have to pinch down a little bit and, and uh, work a little harder, then that's what I would do. Okay, we're going to continue with Orlando Ramirez of La Prensa. And uh, I'd kind of like to follow up on the redevelopment dollars question. Um, recently, the City Council approved a number of projects to protect the redevelopment dollars. Um, the downtown library was not brought forward by city staff for consideration. What do you believe the city should do to rehabilitate the downtown library, which is a, a, a citywide facility that all the city uses, and how would you fund it? We'll start with Mr. Davis. On, on, well, if we can't fund it out of the general fund, then we obviously can't, can't afford to do it. I don't see how um, redevelopment, uh, we have the bonds there. They did appropriate those bonds. And if they've got them now, we might as well use them and, and uh, uh, re redo the library down there. That's one way. A lot of the things, I just saw a big laundry list in the paper of things they wanted to use for that because they were trying to scramble to get that done before the governor actually did take away redevelopment. So, um, which I'll tell you, it's coming. But it doesn't come now with the majority or it'll come at the end of the year. <laughs> he has the majority to get it then. So um, we need to make plans for it. We need to adjust for it. I think that's going to be eliminated. But those uh, redevelopment bonds, they uh, appropriated $90 million in bonds and didn't seem to have a clear 
project they wanted to spend them on. So it had a long laundry list, paving roads, things we do with, out of our natural, uh, uh, the general fund. If we haven't, don't have taxes for that, we've kind of overspent somewhere else. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Bailey? Well, again, again redevelopment, you know, it's, it's designed to, to hopefully generate some revenue. So the projects that the, re the redevelopment agency does uh, should attract businesses to that blighted area or uh, create a, a sales tax generating or property tax generating entity on that property that we redevelop. Um, or, or again, remove blight in, in some cases. Uh, you know, the, the, the funding mechanism uh, which provided, you know, the, the last round of library improvements, I believe it was Measure C, is coming up for a renewal. And I would say to the, to the viewing audience and to the public, we need that to, to be passed again um, to continue the improvements we're doing to not just the downtown library, but the library system. We have a branch system that is the best in, in, in the area, if not the state. Um, you know, every ward has at least one branch. Yes, the downtown branch is important to us, and symbolically it's important, but the, the system's more important than just one, one of the branches. Um, so in, in, in terms of revenue and funding, if we can provide an upgrade to downtown library, which I, obviously it needs, um, we, we, we should be able to do that through uh, the renewal of, of the, the measure to improve the libraries. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mr. Davis, a quick 30-second response if you'd like. Um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, county has contracts out their library uh, operation, and they do it with a private contractor. Saves a lot of in uh, uh, long-term pension costs and things like that. So that would be something else that we would have to look at, uh, again, when you're talking about the negotiations with the unions. I mean, if uh, uh, some of these things could be contracted out to a private contractor and, and save us a lot of long-term money there. Mr. Bailey, would you like to have a quick 30-second response? I'm okay. Okay, terrific. We're going to conclude our last question with uh, Becky Diaz. Gentlemen, what action should the city take to help the businesses impacted by the Magnolia Grade separation project? <laughs> uh, we'll start with Mr. Bailey. Well, we're trying to do that with redevelopment dollars. Uh, the, the biggest impact, again, and what they're arguing, the Lucky Greek ownership is arguing, is we're the biggest impact. We, we're the only uh, drive through restaurant, um, you know, that, that's in and around the area. And, and thus, our traffic counts are going down. Um, they're not going to go back up because of the nature of where they're located. And so we thought we were doing them a favor, uh, as well as providing, um, you know, future higher and better use to that property, potential uh, property tax generator and sales tax generator, not just there, but at the old Marcy Branch Library um, with a, a new model, potentially, of a Lucky Greek deli. That's what they showed me, you know, initially was this deli concept. So it's not just a fast food restaurant. It's a restaurant, a sit-down restaurant, a deli, something bigger and better. And I think that that's what belongs on Central Avenue. Um, we've done other, you know, relocation assistance for the local uh, businesses in the area. Elliott's was retained in Magnolia Center. Uh, Center Lumber was retained in Ward 3, just out on Van Buren. So the city has done, again, a great problem-solving uh, piece to the puzzle uh, for Magnolia Great Separation in, in trying to retain those local businesses and their clientele uh, in War Three, Mr. Davis? Uh, well, the, I, I'm familiar with that situation right there. Uh, but the, the, the Greek restaurant uh, is, is, uh, isolates a small section there with the redevelopment, with the, with the way the street design's there. And it kind of wastes that property there without the restaurant property. It would make a large parcel for someone that doesn't need uh, a street-friendly uh, front on it. So um, I, don't, I have no objections to obtaining that and combining that and making it something more than uh, what's happened. Magnolia is going to be about 20 feet below that restaurant, and, uh, the, and uh, Merrill will be about 8 feet below. So he, nobody's going to see the guy's sign. So that's been a thriving restaurant for years, and uh, uh, he's, he's been a tribute to the community. Plus, there's a bunch of people working in there. So uh, it's important to keep people like that going. Um, that was not my complaint about 
redevelopment when I talked about the appraisal. The appraisal I'm talking about is the appraisal for the Marcy Branch Library, which was lowballed over $100,000. That's where I'm talking about the discrepancy came in. That's where the problem was. 30 second response? It, it wasn't a low ball. What happened is that we left out the parking lot. That there's two parcels there. There's the library and there's the parking lot. And, and staff put forward, uh, you know, not with any backroom deals or smoke and mirrors, they gave us the wrong number. That's one of the reasons why before any watchdogs brought this to our attention, we had corrected that problem, pulled it off a closed session, uh, renegotiated, started renegotiating the deal with the new numbers and the parking lot being included as a part of the project. Mr. Davis? Well, I still still say there was, <laughs> I, I don't agree with that, but because uh, uh, on the second appraisal, all those things were included in it, and the price was much higher. And, and the, the appraisal was not released until the, people started, the two people started complaining about it, and it took them several months to get it, and they said that they couldn't release it because they were in negotiation. They had no problem releasing the original appraisal that was lower. Before we ask for our candidates' closing statements, I want to thank our outstanding panelists. We have Colette Lee, Tower Realty and Rain Cross member, Orlando Ramirez of La Prensa, and Becky Diaz, Rain Cross Group. Thank you again so very much. We will have two minute closing statements. We're going to start with Mr. Davis. Okay, I, I want to talk about the redevelopment. Uh, both the state controller, John Chang, and the legislative analysts have, have published reports regarding the lack of accountability and transparency of our redevelopment agencies. The controller reviewed 18 of the 425 RDAs and reports that none of them met the filing requirements. 27% of our county taxes are diverted into RDAs. Eliminating RDAs would mean more money for our local agencies, like uh, public safety and schools. This money would not go to the state. So uh, a study by Cal State Sacramento also uh, estimates that uh, state regulations cost one job per small business. Small business provides 92% of the jobs in California. What can one person do? One person can get the ball rolling to create a friendly business atmosphere and stop driving our employers out of the state. As a blue collar worker, I know that we must support, protect our employers to have a job. This election, we offer two different paths for voters of Ward 3. If you're happy with the direction the city's going, your choice is clear. If you want to change a fair pension system and transparency, then I suggest you vote for me. I don't expect city workers to line up and vote for me, but I do ask the business owners and the general public who want an equal voice in this city to vote for me. You have until May 23rd to register. This election is by mail, so mark your ballots and mail it back in. It doesn't take that much effort. I relish the challenge and look forward to serving all of Riverside. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Bailey. Riverside Renaissance was successful because it touched every neighborhood in this city. From guts to brains, it has impacted the way we deliver services to this city and has enhanced the quality of life for every Riversider. From water pipes to sewers to electrical infrastructure, libraries, parks, and the Fox Theater, the Renaissance is our competitive advantage for creating jobs and attracting businesses and employers to Riverside. The question now is, what's next for Riverside? Do we wait another 30 years for another renaissance? Do we rest on our loyal, laurels? And the obvious answer is, heck no. We charge ahead. Through the many challenges we face to our quality of life, it is time to seize our destiny. This is not just a document. This is a comprehensive community movement. It calls us to action, to accelerate momentum, reach farther, choose wisely, and involve everyone. My alma mater's motto is duty, honor, country. And now my motto is duty, honor, city. What's your motto? How will you be involved in seizing our city's destiny? Some of my contributions thus far. First one, transforming spaces into places. Using my connections at a national level to transform a downtown parking lot into a beach with over 5,000 tons of sand and professional volleyball players from around the world, including the gold medalist from Beijing. This impacted our city with a $1 million economic benefit in both direct and indirect investments into our city over that week of activity. Another way, big city recreation with a hometown feel. Most recently, a couple weekends ago, the U.S. Cup mountain bike race came to Riverside Sycamore Canyon Park because of a friend of mine, and the reactions of the riders, the bike riders on Facebook, ranged from number one ride on the circuit 
to this place is beautiful. Who knew Riverside had something like this? How can you become a bridge builder between your networks and into the city of Riverside to generate excitement and economic activity for our residents? As you can tell, I love this city and desire to continue to serve it as Ward 3's city councilman. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. That concludes the 2001 Rain Cross debate for Ward 3. We congratulate the candidates on a very fine job. We'd also like to thank our viewers at PE.com and Charter Channel 101. I personally would like to thank Tom Donahue and Phil Pitchford of the Rain Cross Group, Maria de Verain of the Press Enterprise, Del Heinz and Sandra Magana of Charter Communications for inviting me to moderate. And of course, I thank our panelists Special thank you to the Press Enterprise and Charter Communications whose efforts made this debate possible and who will bring this broadcast of thousands of homes across the city. We're streaming live on PE.com right now. It will be archived. And in the next few weeks, you can watch all these debates on Charter Channel 101. If you're not a Charter customer, see me after. We can make that happen. I'd also like to thank uh, for outreach the League of Women Voters, the PIC Group, and the Latino Network for contributing to our questions. And finally, a very big thank you to Cal Baptist University for their ongoing support of the Rain Cross debates. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, applause is appropriate. Remember, this is a mail in election. Ward 1 in 2007 was de decided by seven votes. Be sure to vote. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Thank you for watching.